Welcome to this virtual voting village talk, vulnerability disclosures for voting systems, a deep dive into vulnerability disclosure programs among the most popular voting system vendors. Uh, thanks for coming. I wish I could be there in Vegas with you, but alas, uh, the COVID weather is, is just too severe, so couldn't make it this year. Next year, for sure, right? So yeah, I'm Todd Beardsley. I am the Director of Research at Rapid7, and I deal with vulnerability disclosure pretty regularly. Um, and I also, incidentally, <laughs> uh, care about election security and election integrity. Uh, and because of that, I'm also an election judge here in, in Travis County, Texas. Uh, if you want to find me or look up my stuff, uh, you, a great starting point is uh, keybase.io slash Todd B. Uh, all my Twitters and all my stuff is there, so check it out there. Uh, but enough about me. On to the voting machines that we're all interested in hacking, I guess. All right, I'm up in the corner now. Um, I'll be here for most of the presentation just to stay out of your way. Uh, first off, let's uh, blast through some terms that I am likely to use all of the time. Uh, they are uh, Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure or CVD. Um, this is the process by which I typically uh, disclose vulnerabilities. Um, typically, it starts with uh, a researcher, almost always who is not me. Uh, occasionally, I do my own vulns, but mostly these days, I help other other people uh, disclose vulnerabilities. And um, this, for me, like this is all about uh, getting the vendor and uh, the researcher and you know any other interested parties, maybe a regulatory agency or somebody like that, uh, all on the same page, all ready to go, all agreeing on what the vulnerability is, severity, descriptions, mitigations, fixes, all that stuff. That whole thing from beginning to end, from discovery to eventual public disclosure, that's CVD. So if I see, say CVD, that's what I mean. Uh, also, uh, I use another acronym, VDP, a Vulnerability Disclosure Program. Um, a Vulnerability Disclosure Program is pretty much, in my opinion, is pretty much anything where uh, you are a vendor of software, uh, which is to say all companies and, all, and most organizations. Uh, you have some kind of software product. Um, it might be embedded. It might be a, you know, a typical app on a phone. It might be a typical program. Uh, it might be server side. It might be uh, your website. It might be your back end. It might be anything, right? Um, basically, what we're looking for in a VDP is some way to contact you and let you know about this vulnerability. I don't super care like about the details of it. Just if you have a VDP, great. Um, and you're in you're you're in rare company if you do. And then finally. Uh, we have bug bounty programs. Uh, I talk about it a little bit. Nobody calls them uh, BBs. Uh, this is something we don't acronym. I don't know why. Uh, but a bug bounty program is is basically uh, like a VDP, except there's usually uh, money involved. Uh, uh, so not always. Sometimes it's just like for like kudos and karma or whatever. Um, Almost always, there's some kind of more formal NDA in place, usually restricting uh, the the reporter of the vulnerability from from talking about it until the the receiver, the bug bounty uh, runner, um, does a thing. Either they fix it. Um, very occasionally, they mm, I would say occasionally, not very occasionally anymore. Occasionally, they have uh, like a timeout procedure. So if so much time has passed, then you're free to publish. Um, but but yeah, so that is the deal uh, with bug bounties. So um, actually finding VDPs in the wild um, is not terribly hard. Uh, you know, I, I look at a few things. I look at bug crowd, um, hacker one and disclose IO. Um, I bring up bug crowd and hacker one because they're bug bounty programs and it's in their interest to to really let you know um, that such and such a company has a bug bounty program, which is a you know a, a species of VDP. It's not the only kind of, of VDP, but it's a species of it. Um, Disclose IO and Bug Crowd are like this, and Disclose IO runs a, a pretty nice um, community um, sorted uh, uh, directory of, of vulnerability disclosure programs. Right. Um, I also look for the security.txt file uh, that should be uh, on a given company's or product even website. So like let's say you work at Acme Corp um, and your website is acmecorp.com. Um, you would have a security.txt in Acme, 
acmecorp.com slash dot well dash known slash security dot text. You can learn a lot about this uh, at securitytext.org. Um, it is a great way to tell people and it's like um, that, well, let me back up. It's a great way to tell people about your vulnerability disclosure program, um, what the policy is, who to contact, a PGP key, languages, all kind of stuff can go in there. Um, but the minimum is like some kind of contact information. Uh, I look for that basically second these days. <laughs> I'm usually disappointed. Uh, sometimes I come across one. Um, and then finally, if those don't pan out, I Google dork around, right, for vulnerability, for the word disclosure, for the word security, and whatever the organization or, or the product name is. Um, typically, if these, if all of these fail, this tends to succeed. Um, you know, it's a very jargony sort of business we're in with vulnerability disclosure. So these words all together, uh, almost always first page, great SEO, right? Um, so if you are running one and people don't know where it is, make sure that this Google dork works and, and people will find it. Um, if all of this fails, I kind of have to assume that you don't have a vulnerability disclosure program. That might not be true, um, you know, and there's certainly other ways to have, to advertise VDPs, um, but if, if it's not one of these like five things, basically, uh, it is effectively invisible to uh, certainly me and I would say most, uh, most people who are in the business of vulnerability disclosure. And by business, I mean charity, almost always. Um, you know, uh, bug bounty programs are, are a little bit special and they tend to have their own thing. But again, like, and it's totally possible to run a bug bounty program without Bug Crowd or HackerOne, for sure. Um, but if you're running your own homegrown bug bounty program and you're not hitting that Google dork or not hitting that security that text, um, this is an easy, easy problem to solve. So so let's take a look at the Fortune 500 just for context. Um, this is not, uh, you know, none of these uh, voting system manufacturers are in the Fortune 500, um, but uh, we can take a look at the Fortune 500 and see what's going on there, like kind of just a level set, like how common are VDPs out in the, the real world? You know, this is the world of uh, name brands, um, you know, the most successful and highest revenue companies, uh, lots of tech companies, lots of manufacturing companies, lots of everything, right, uh, in the Fortune 500. Um, back in March, uh, I ran around and counted all of these uh, using exactly that methodology I just I just talked about. Uh, and you can read that report if you like. Um, it's it's on Rapid7. If you just do like Rapid7 ICER, uh, you'll find it. it's the Industry Cyber Exposure Report. Uh, and uh, if this were in person, I would ask for people to guess how many of the Fortune 500 have a VDP. Uh, and then I would chortle and say, you're wrong, because it's actually this many. Um, it's um, just about 20%, almost 100 uh, of the Fortune 500 have a VDP. Now, they're not all in the top 100. Top 100 is overrepresented. Um, Fortune 100 has about 40% of these, and then the rest are kind of scattered throughout um, the, the remaining 400. But that like gives us an idea of like, well, how common are these, right? Uh, and I will say that on a given very successful company, um, about 20% have an active findable VDP today. So how do I pick uh, voting machines, um, or I'm sorry, voting system manufacturers? Well, I look at um, the EAC, or the US Election Assistance Commission. Um, they run a program uh, that certifies uh, vendors uh, in this space. And uh, one quick caveat um, before I talk about those, um, not every vendor is certified by the EAC, and uh, not every EAC um, certified uh, uh, vendor is in any of the, uh, all of the states, right? Um, or, and by state, I mean locality. So which ones are they? Um, well, they're these ones. There's Avante, Clear Ballot, Dominion Voting, ESS, ESNS, Hard Interactive, Microvote, Smartmatic, uh, Unison, and Voting Works. Uh, those are the nine vendors uh, that are part, that that participate with the EAC, get their stuff certified. Um, there's mountains of documentation on the EAC, and this is not an EAC talk, so I'll just go by there. I'll just stop there. But like these are the nine companies that I'm looking at um, to see like who has vulnerability disclosure program. Um, and as I mentioned before, quick caveat: um, this is where any of these companies operate t um, today. And by today, I mean I think this uh, survey was for the last election, the 2020 um, uh, presidential election. Uh, so you can see that like not even 
every like there are a few states where it's 100 percent eac certified voting machines um some states have none uh some of them are rather large like california and new york and florida um all of the um decision making on what voting systems a given locality uses that tends to devolve down to the county um, but if you're in the voting village you probably know that uh, so moving on uh, from there so among the vdps who which are uh, eac certified uh, how many of them have some kind of vdp how many of them are welcoming of vulnerability information on their products that are installed and people cast votes on or are used to tabulate votes or anything like that any election system kind of deal what do you think uh well you are right some of you. <laughs> uh, it is better uh, than the Fortune 500. It is uh, about 55% uh, or 5 out of 9 uh, have some kind of VDP. So uh, good job. Good job, guys. Uh, we're doing better uh, than, than we were even, even a year ago. Uh, most of these are very new. Um, and so just to remind you, 55% um, of uh, voting system manufacturers uh, have a VDP about 20 percent of the fortune 500 have a vdp and so that is that is better uh it is it is greater than so good job guys um so for the for the next section i want to like kind of dive it, this is the deep dive part um i want to dive deep onto these uh vdp so i read all of them so you don't have to um and first and foremost let's just knock out the ones that don't have any vdp at all uh that is avante microvote smartmatic and voting works Guys, uh, get on the stick there. Um, but of the rest, all of these, re the rest of these do have some kind of VDP. But not all VDPs are created equal, right? Um, of those that have a VDP, uh, some of them don't actually cover the voting machines and customer implementations. So that knocks out Heart Inner Civic and uh, Unison. So uh, if you recall from, from last year at Black Hat uh, and, and DEF CON time, uh, I know that uh, some of these vendors said like, yes, we have a VDP and we are anxious to work with uh, researchers. Uh, well, not so fast. Um, these two companies in particular, Heart Inner Civic and uh, Unison, their vulnerability disclosure program only covers their own website. Um, and so great that they have one, uh, but not so great that they, they, they have a written policy that says that their voting machines and any like customer implementation implementations are, are off limits, which is weird. It's kind of not a VDP anymore, but hey, you have a VDP. So wonderful of those that have a VDP, uh, that do cover customer implementations who has a safe Harbor policy. Well, it's not clear ballot. <laughs> clear ballot is a little weird. Um, they do have a place to report vulnerabilities. They publish an email address and they talk about their security a lot, um, but they don't actually seem to have any written policy. At least I couldn't find one. And if you know someone at Clear Ballot, reach out to me. Uh, I'd love to be able to find it. Um, it is, if it exists, it's invisible. Um, so you're welcome to report vulnerability to them, but it's like unclear how they'll take it, uh, which, is, which is fine, right? Um, I'm glad they have some way of doing it, I guess. So ESNS um, and Dominion uh, are the only two EAC certified voting system manufacturers that actually offer a clear, unambiguous safe harbor uh, for researchers and hackers uh, in their vulnerability disclosure program. So yay, congratulations guys, you did it. Um, ESNS and Dominion, I do believe their heart is in the right place. Um, they're a pretty great place to report vulnerabilities. Incidentally, between ESNS and Dominion, you're looking at most of the voting machines in America, including in those areas that, you know, aren't required to have EAC certified uh, voting machines. Um, they still use them. Um, they may be like back a rev, or they may just use them and not bother to tell the EAC because, you know, hands off my local government, you big federal nasties, uh, or whatever reason, right? So it's certainly possible to run into um, a voting system from one of the other of these companies uh, in a locality that, that EAC doesn't know about. So if you find vulnerabilities there, you are, it's smooth sailing. Um, good job. And let them know because they want to hear about it. Um, but of all the other companies, don't give up. You know, if you find, if you're a researcher or a hacker or an academic and you find some kind of vulnerability involving one of these systems, I mean, it doesn't hurt to try. <laughs> I wouldn't say just sit on it because uh, that doesn't help anyone, right? Um, and so uh, this, uh, you know, this is 
this is my opinion anyway. Um, some people are are real sketch about uh, trying to report vulnerabilities to a place that doesn't have a clear and concise and unambiguous uh, safe harbor provision for, for hackers. Um, so these companies are less likely to get decent vulnerability intelligence from, you know, good Samaritans out on the internet um, than ESNS and, and Dominion. Um, but it doesn't mean that you have to be that way, right? Like it is, of, of course, it's our, all up to your own risk tolerance very similar to traveling to Las Vegas during COVID. Um, it's up to you and it's up to like how you deal with it. Um, but basically like if you have a vulnerability on a voting system manufacturer that's not on that list or which is on that list, but their terms are like real restrictive uh, or they might be on the list. Like you found an issue, but you're not super sure what it's for. Like maybe you found some kind of SQL injection bug in some, you know, in like an e-poll book that's online or something like that, right? Like it's not directly a voting, it's not like a voting machine compromise, but it's a backend system compromise or like a, maybe a middleware or a front end uh, for some county. Like, and it may be run by one of these companies. These companies don't just produce voting machines, as you know. They they often do the end-to-end -end, um, management of, of the voting machines, the ballot box, the e-poll books, the collection, all of the stuff. Right? Um, they they may be all up in that in a, in that business. If you find a vulnerability in a candidate's website or in something in their infrastructure or in their campaign, um, what do you do? Um, or if it's like in a general political party issue, like as we all know, uh, political parties are not immune uh, to, to hackery and are not um, certainly not immune to like not patching something. Um, so if it's a political party or PAC, what do you do? Well. Uh, I'm here to tell you, uh, there is a one-stop shop these days. Uh, I used to have a long, complicated answer for this, but now I have a very short and terse answer, and it's SZA. Um, SZA is pronounced not like pizza, by the way, uh, but it's SZA. It's the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agencies. So secure the name fit twice with secure. Um, I would say that, like, in all cases, if you see something, say something. Um, CISA is generally pretty good about this. Uh, they have some really talented people there still um, and continue to be like pretty responsive. Um, if you, uh, yeah, so if you're not comfortable uh, with uh, <laughs> uh, interacting with CISA for whatever reason, um, you should know that um, as far as I know, uh, they've never, gone after anyone they've never they never hassled anybody they've never like turned around and you know ratted anybody out to the doj or anything like that they've they've always been on the up and up and they are sincere in wanting to know about your vulnerabilities um to fix them <laughs> um and they are specifically excluded um this whole vulnerability intelligence gathering function that they have they're excluded from the uh vulnerability equities program if you've heard of that uh, and are worried about that um they're excluded from that so uh spooks and spies will not use your vulnerability in the meantime um you know unless they're doing something like super duper illegal like spying on CISA, which that never happens right <laughs> um Inter, there's there's no such thing as interagency conflict, um, but they're they're a great backstop for basically anything related to civilian government, um, including these issues. So uh, I urge you uh, get in touch with CISA, um, and and they will they will take care of you. If you have a bad experience with CISA, let me know, and I will I will I don't know be your champion and your white knight, I guess. Um, I just wanted to take a moment uh, to talk about the R word, and that is reasonable or responsible disclosure. I try to use reasonable disclosure as a as a term, but it's just not it's just not taken off. Um, but uh, let's talk a, a little just a little bit about responsibility. Now that we've talked about like who has a VDP, maybe you run into a situation where you're not comfortable with the VDP, or you don't find a VDP or something like that. What do you do then, right? Um, uh, so the the rest of this talk, and it's, I'm almost at the end here because these are these are all real short uh, talks. Um, the rest of this talk is just uh, pro tips, uh, just a couple. Grab bag of pro tips. Uh, so first off, uh, timing considerations. Um, nobody does anything without a deadline. If you report a vulnerability and don't say you're going to do something in a certain amount of time, uh, I guarantee you, no one will do anything with it. Um, they will. They may reply. They may say, "Oh, thank you for the thing," and you'll never hear from them again. Um, in my experience uh, in disclosing a few hundred vulnerabilities, being upfront with that deadline is everything. Um, what's extra great is being able to tell people like, hey, I found a vulnerability. 
I would love to publish this by the next conference, whatever that conference is. You can make it up. You can lie. It's fine. Um, but just pick a security conference off the calendar that's like a couple months ahead, you know, um, and uh, and and do that, right? Um, provide them with regular reminders that this deadline is approaching and you have to do the thing. Um, you know, if you want to say a conference or a CFP or just say a date, um, or if you say, or if like you work at a company or whatever and you want to publish these things on your company's blog, like I do all the time, um, you know, let them know. Um, you don't have to be a jerk about it. You don't have to say like, hey, I haven't heard from you in like six hours and what's the deal here and blah, blah, blah. Like, you should know that like vulnerability disclosure from the receiving end is usually a pretty emotional event. Um, so anything like I strongly urge you to go hang out with um, the social engineering folks over in social engineering land uh, and learn how to uh, make people believe that you're on their side, <laughs> I guess is the best way to put it. Um, but yeah, you don't have to be a jerk about it. Um, allow for extensions on your deadline. Um, if you have a deadline in mind, um, know that things happen and sometimes deadlines slip. Um, so if you're using the conference excuse, super, um, you know, that, that is, I think, a, I think, a okay. Nobody cares about your conference, by the way, you care about it. Uh, they definitely do not. Um, so if you blow through it, then you have mechanisms, you know, of disclosing without specifically naming the vendor and you can you can give that up, right? And say like, well, listen, I'm going to publish some details, but I won't say your name and I won't say who it is and I'll black out all your logos. And then they'll, they'll feel, they'll, they'll feel cared for if you do something like that. And, uh, I don't know how to do it any way, but try not to notice these bugs <laughs> right before or right after an election, um, because of reasons. Um, since 2016, uh, the general public is, uh, aware of us and aware of our activities here and so if you go to the news and say like hey i know about a vulnerability in you know dominion or esns or whoever um and you disclose that like two or three days before an election you're causing a bunch of chaos now maybe that's your maybe that's what you want to do maybe that's your thing um not my thing but maybe that's your thing. I strongly urge you uh, to not do that. If you want, like the best time to disclose bugs is, is like today, right now. Um, we are a year before the next um, uh, congressional, national congressional elections. There's almost always an election going on, um, usually two or three times a year in most localities, there's, uh, there's an election. Um, but then, you know, you've got headline elections too. So uh, be sensitive about that. Uh, please, and you don't have to cause a huge, huge tussle uh, over your vaults. Um, just as an aside, uh, these three companies uh, do have EDPs, and they state uh, in no uncertain terms the kinds of deadlines they expect, um, which is great. It's good for you. Like, you know now, and you can, and that actually gives you a huge amount of ammunition because you can tell these companies, like, hey, man, you said 120 days, so that's coming up. Um, and, you know, they will still, uh, somewhat regularly ask for some extension because of something. Um, there's like a whole recertification process. There's a bunch of things that go into these things, right? So um, with voting systems in particular, um, expect, definitely expect like a response pretty quick, but like an ultimate fix may be a little white ways out. Um, I do think that like opening with like 45 days or 60 days or 90 days um, is a pretty good opener and fairly reasonable for like just tech in general. Um, you know, I know this is a fact because every open source project I disclose vulnerabilities to, they can turn them around in a day. Um, it's always these proprietary software things that have, have troubles with more than that. But Anyway, uh, they have they have their own uh, preferences there, and, and good for them for saying it out loud. Um, when you're um, looking at your eventual public disclosure, and I promise I'm almost done, uh, when you look at your public disclosure, just be clear on the attack scenario, um, be clear on the hardware. If it's a hardware attack, if it's a radio attack, if it's a trusted network attack, or if it's an internet attack, right? These are all very different kind of levels of, of scalability for attackers. So be clear about that. Um, when you're disclosing vulnerabilities and when you're talking about it, you should have at your fingertips at all times, the name of whatever the system is. Um, they have several. Um, every one of these vendors has several of these things. Um, they have several versions of these things. And so be sure that if, 
if at all possible, like get that version number. If you have one that you've taken apart, um, get the FCC IDs. Those are great. Um, get serial numbers. Anything that like identifies the the machine is perfect. Um, and also, of course, note if it's a default config versus a custom config. Um, you know that can go. That you know a lot of people can get real confused if you are talking about something that only happens in like a rare custom config. Uh, on the flip side, if there's a custom config that's like a de facto default because the de defaults are nonsense or you know nobody uses them um, then then be clear about that as well and finally um, when you're dealing with the media uh, reporters always want razzle dazzle especially with this um, especially with with voting systems uh, they will many will try to push you into oversimplifying the attack and will try to put words in your mouth and try to like lead you down a a narrative that makes sense and that a narrative that makes sense is like the hallmark of fiction <laughs> when it turns out. Um, so be careful about that. Uh, journalists don't usually control their own headlines. Um, and so you might have a great experience with a great journalist and then you see a headline that is totally wrong. And well, that's the editor's problem. Um, you know, clicks, clicks going to bait, I guess. Um, when you disclose these vulnerabilities, uh, be prepared to deal with crazy people. <laughs> um, there are a few of them out there uh, that especially pay attention to things like voting machines. I'm sure you can talk to any of the voting security superstars that are that are at this event um, and ask them about the crazy people uh, that they've that they've interacted with. Um, and and just finally, like your bug is beautiful. Um, it is beautiful and unique and it is special. And because of that, you are incredibly biased about your bugs. So just keep that in mind. Um, when someone tries to talk you out of, you know, trying to, trying to lower a CVSS rating or wants to say like, well, that's not actually really how it works. Like try to listen to it. Uh, it's very hard. Sometimes it's hard to hear, just like it's hard to hear that your software is vulnerable. It's hard to hear that your bug kind of sucks. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you want any help on all, any of this, ask me. I'm a guy who does this all the time. Uh, you can write to me uh, at Rapid7. You can find me on Twitter. My DMs are open. Uh, and with that, thank you so much. Uh, I'm done. So uh, I'll be around on the Discord um, and happy to talk about your cool, cool vulnerabilities.